So on the subject of natives and uh, slaves during the time, I wanted to make sure to include some readings from you know, those groups in this collection, because it's one thing to read about white men talking about the situations these people are facing, and it's another thing entirely to get, uh, you know, get it straight from there their perspective. I think that's important to, to honor that. So unfortunately the, the options are pretty limited on that because there just wouldn't have been a lot of literature produced by, by those groups at the time for fairly obvious reasons and certainly not easily published or disseminated. So luckily though, we've got two really exemplary authors we can discuss. Phyllis Wheatley, who was born in 1753 and died in 1784. So, wow, 31, not, uh, oops, <laughs> yikes. So this is Phyllis Wheatley in the corner up here. And she was best known for her Christian poems. She did write on a variety of topics, but those were the ones she was most well known for. She was actually taken from, uh, from a, an African country as a slave at the age of seven. So she would have remembered that almost certainly. Uh, she was sold in Boston to a woman named Susanna Wheatley, which is where she would have gotten the last name, and she would have been named Phyllis. And they were a pious Christian household. She was basically, Susanna purchased her, to, they, they couldn't have children of their own, Susanna and her husband, so she purchased Phyllis as sort of a, uh, almost more like an adoption so they, Phyllis was really, they said, a slave in name only. It was token, quote unquote, token slavery. Now, was she still held to the same laws as, as other slaves? Were there things she was absolutely denied the right to do regardless? Sure. Um, do we know, do we really know much about how she was treated by the Wheatleys? Not really, but, but what we, from most accounts, she was, as much as possible anyway, um, treated as, as an actual daughter by them. So she was tutored by the family in English, Latin, and the Bible. She was, by all accounts, an, uh, a prodigy of a child. She, from a very early age, learned languages and was able to, to read the Bible incredibly well, you know, right, almost right away. Um, they figured out very quickly that Phyllis was extremely bright and exceptional. And so for that reason, they, they went out of their way to, to tutor her and make sure that she was well educated. I mean, it, which would have been completely unheard of for the time for, for a slave. Um, so she, that's why we even have any of her work today. Her first poems were actually published was when she was 13 in a Rhode Island newspaper. She did try, with the help of her um, adoptive mother slash owner, Susanna, to get a volume of her poetry published, but she was never able to do that in America due to racial barriers. So um, she instead was published overseas and then later on became, you know, accepted here in America. So her poetry reflects a dual sense of self as an African, but also as an American. And there's actually a video, uh, the, the picture up here in the corner is a link to a YouTube video. It's short, but it talks about that du dual sense of being both African and American and being sort of pulled in between the two identities and having to somehow navigate the, the paradox of that. I suggest you watch it. It's very helpful. And again, she never did publish in America in her lifetime due to those, you know, institutionalized racist policies. But she was published overseas where they would have allowed something like that. So, uh, Phyllis Wheatley's legacy has lasted up to this day. This is actually an image that is from the Phyllis Wheatley Community Center in Greenville, South Carolina. There are a lot of things named after Phyllis Wheatley. So her, even though she had a hard time getting uh, her voice heard when she was alive, her legacy definitely continues and is strong to this day. Samson Oakham, again, another sort of minority voice, and you've got a, a longer reading from, from him with Phyllis Wheatley. It's just a poem, but for Samson Oakham, there's uh, two things. There's 
his autobiography, basically, story of his life, and also a sermon that he gave at the execution of one of his uh, fellow Indians for the murder of a white man. So please read both of those. This is background on Samson Oakham. This is, that's him up here in the corner. He was born in 1723 and lived until 1792, so he would have been alive for uh, revolution. He was a member of the Mohegan tribe, uh, living on Mohegan land in what is now Connecticut. So he was taken under the wing of a congregational minister named Eliezer Wheelock, where he started to study theology with him. It, uh, Ali, Mr. Wheelock um, like recognized something in Samson's, said, you know, he's, wow, he's really, really smart and bright, and he is really interested in, in Christian theology, so I'm going to try to, you know, make him my protege. Uh, he actually became, he was the first ordained Indian minister in the colonies, and he briefly attended Yale uh, before going on to become a schoolmaster and a Presbyterian minister, and he served as a missionary to various Indian communities in New England and Long Island. He actually traveled to England to raise money for an Indian charity school that Wheelock was going to start. So he went all the way to England and uh, went around raising funds and talking to, to anyone who'd listen, you know, speaking at events and trying to raise money for this, this school. And then uh, Wheelock actually <laughs> didn't use the money for that. He instead founded what is now Dartmouth College. And understandably, Oakham was incredibly insulted by this. Uh, all of he was very disappointed. All of the work, uh, years of work that he put in and raising this money for what he thought was a very worthy cause. Wheelock didn't use it for that, and there's really nothing that Oakham could do about it. And but he ended up cutting ties with Wheelock forever after that, and kind of going his own way. And so he ended up founding several settlements, including what uh, ultimately became known as the Brother Town Indians. So his his legacy was pretty far reaching, but which is what, you know, enables him to kind of write this autobiography and, and give a voice to his experiences. Uh, it's, it can, it can be hard to read at times because of all of the, the things that he had to go through having to work 10 times as hard as, as a white man for a fraction of the salary, for instance, things like that constantly throughout the autobiography. There's just so much struggle and toil on, on Oakham's part. And it's, it, uh, it, it can be a little depressing to read, but it's important to know, you know, what conditions were like and what, what the status quo was like for someone even as exceptional as him during that time. And yeah, he was actually the first Native American to publish writings in English, so he's pretty well known for that. All right, and I'm stuck. Sorry about that. These computers are a little old, so things get a little glitchy. So let's go ahead and move on to the topic of the American Revolution, which actually really started brewing long before 1775. Some sources put the revolution technically starting at 1765, but we're going to stick with the, the conventional date of 1775, uh, leading all, lasting all the way until 1783. So the image that I've got here up on the screen was a kind of propaganda piece that Benjamin Franklin was responsible for creating to basically like inspire people to join up with the the, col the colonists, the revolutionary cause, the patriots. And it's a, a pretty clear, simplified message that, you know, well, you can see the, the snake, uh, kind of re reminiscent of the whole don't tread on me snake, but also we can see the snake has been cut into pieces and those various pieces are the different states, different col what would go on to be those states, those different colonies. And in being separate from each other, the snake dies, but together they live. So I think the message is pretty clear there. Join or die. So what was grinding their gears? What were the grievances leading up to the revolution? Again, this really started earlier on, uh, starting in the 1750s, so about halfway through the century. Uh, the French Indian War was a, a big part of the grievances. This caused a lot of problems for the colonists, and 
uh, it led to the result of of the Indian French Indian War led to a vast accumulation of British territory by the end of the war. So basically, the the British had gone to war with the the French slash Indians, so the, the Indians sided with the French on this, and they ended up losing all these territories. So the British were able to accumulate a lot a lot more territory that previously had been under French control by the time 1763 rolled around, but the war itself just absolutely depleted the British treasury as wars tend to do. They're very expensive. And so the, the, the British, you know, crown, the British leaders have to get money to restock the treasury. So where are they going to get it? Um, they're going to tax the heck out of the colonists. So, well, the colonists have money and yeah, they've got stuff over there. Let's that we control them. So let's just tax, tax, tax away to, put the coffers back in order. So there were so many of them, but it led to a bunch of different acts on the part of the, the Patriots to to resist. So there was the Sugar Act of 1763, which basically was a boycott of all imported British goods, like stop buying British goods to, to show your displeasure at having our sugar taxed. There was the Stamp Act of 1765, which basically required colonists to pay a tax on anything like every single piece of printed paper that they use which we talked about you know the printing press being invented so there's lots of paper being being used for political reasons and for you know all kinds of other reasons so they were going to tax every single piece of paper and they even taxed playing cards so that just really rubbed them the wrong way and so this led to a de declaration of rights and grievances which declared that the taxes imposed on these on the colonists were not done with their consent and were therefore unconstitutional. You can't just start throwing in random taxes left and right. Uh, it needs to be discussed first, and it was not discussed with them, and they did not appreciate that. And there were several more acts from that, including the Tea Act, uh, where for there being a tax on tea, and this led to open revolt in 1776. So again, you know, history kind of portrays the revolution as being something that everybody was singularly for, um, you know, and if you weren't, then you were, uh, you know, a royalist traitor kind of thing, but it, it really wasn't that simple. There was quite a bit of debate over revolution. It took quite a bit of doing to get to that point and not everybody was super confident about it going forward. So a lot of it had to do with where you lived. So geography and, and demographics really determined attitude toward the revolution. So in the north, of course, the, the position was no tax, no taxation without representation. We are being taxed, but when our needs are not being represented, we don't, ha we aren't allowed to have representatives, you know, in the House of Commons and Parliament back in, back in uh, uh, Britain. So all these decisions are being made without our without our consent, and without any kind of representation. It's just not fair. The South, on the other hand, were, had different concerns. So because it's, you know, again, plantations, the, the white members of the society had a, their, their biggest concern was just maintaining control over huge slave populations, which vastly outnumbered white citizens. They were, that, that was their primary concern. And so they were busy folk, busy focusing on that and the idea of of going to war just they're like we've got our own problems sorry <laughs> um of course non-whites in the south they were faced with the question of all right who do we side with um because you know w is it going to lead to emancipation or is it going to lead to our continued enslavement so we really need to choose wisely and the british did try to turn the tide by offering sort of emancipation to any slaves that side, sided with them, which that comes up in Thomas Paine's writings as being like, how dare they try to turn our own slaves against us? Dirty pool, old man. And then on the Western frontier, they were just concerned, whites were just concerned about native uh, attacks. And so they did support revolution for that reason, because um, they, again, were, they needed they wanted British control to, to rule out the day to protect them. And the natives just kind of stayed out of it. They were like, you know what, we're not, we tried siding with a war, you know, with the whole thing last time, French Indian War, and that didn't go well. So we're just going to stay out of it this time. 